We are in a world today, even different to, to 10, 15 years ago, where being vulnerable and being developed and getting feedback is no longer seen as a weakness. This is Reveal, the Revenue Intelligence Podcast, here to help go-to-market leaders do one thing, stop guessing. If you're ready to unlock reality and reach your full potential, this podcast is for you. I'm Danny Wasserman. And I'm Karina Owens, coming to you from the Gong Studios. Karina, we have an inspiring conversation to share with the listeners. We got the opportunity to chat with Nick Goldberg, founder and CEO of Ezra Coaching. And this coaching solution is used by some of the biggest brands out there, Microsoft, Jaguar, and Land Rover, and the list goes on. Yeah, what I really appreciated most from this episode was Nick's approach to basically accessibility when it comes to education in all its forms. So what I love about this episode with Nick is that you can really hear the intent and purpose behind Ezra, which is that their mission is truly to democratize coaching and disseminating it to all levels of the organization. So the way we work has forever changed. And for the first time, certainly in my lifetime, Employees take the reins here and can truly demand a better way of working in a way that I think is fair and equitable and allows you to truly invest in yourself. I know that having heard my bosses and their bosses, oh, I have this executive coach and me thinking, but I want coaching too as someone who is an executive. So love the work Nick's doing. Anything else you want to tell the listeners before we dive in? No, I'm ready for it. Let's go for it. What a day to bring in someone who certainly spoke to Karina and my heart. What could be better than Ezra for all those late 90s angsty band nerds who are listening to that killer band? No, we are listening today to Nick Goldberg, the CEO of Ezra, someone who fundamentally believes that unlocking better business can be done by unleashing the power of better coaching. Nick Goldberg, welcome to Reveal. Thank you. Great to be here, both of you. Oh, man. Well, we are excited to demystify what constitutes Ezra's role in the marketplace. So excited to see you guys growing by evangelizing coaching. I'm curious, when you support big brands, brands that we all think about, McDonald's, Microsoft, different, obviously, industries, but I'm curious, how did you originally discover that there was a need in the market for these monolithic companies using what Ezra can provide? I think for me, you know, it, it sounds cliche, but it started with a very personal experience. At a very young age, uh, I, I got myself a coach. Um, I was doing a job that was way above my station. Maybe I shouldn't share this with the world, but maybe I didn't know exactly what I was doing when I took that job. And the company kindly offered me the support of having a coach and the confidence it gave me the ability to have a safe space to talk about some of my challenges and really help me think it through was was a massive part of my career and my progression. And then in the organization I, I was at previously, um, where we actually did provide kind of very top level executive coaching to people, the kind of coaching that has always existed, where only the most senior people, the lucky people get coaches. We were one of the companies that sold that. Um, but one thing we did is we gave it to all our staff. Because it's like if you work at a, at a retailer, um, if you work at the Nike store, you get cheap or free pairs of Nikes. And one thing we did in that previous company is we gave our staff free coaching because we could, because we had coaches on the payroll. So I was seeing very junior people get coaching and quite frankly saw the impact it had on them was greater than the impact it had on the most senior people. And I remember this is six, seven years ago, sitting there in my office thinking, why don't we figure out a way to give coaching to more than just the executive? But we knew that six years ago, if you remember um, when you use FaceTime six years ago, um, or Zoom or anything like this, nine times out of 10, it would buffer or go wrong. We knew technology needed to play a role, but the timing just wasn't right. So about two years later, in fact, when I was on in the UK, we have something called Babylon Health. In America, you have something called Teladoc, where you speak to your doctor on a FaceTime type in interaction. 
And when, when I did that, I was like, right, if I can talk to my doctor this way, I can certainly talk to a coach this way. And we said, right, we've got to figure out a way to take this executive coaching superpower and release it to the thousands. And we knew technology needs to play a role, but we certainly knew ourselves that it had an impact because we'd seen it in our own business. When you talk about the genesis of Ezra and you're in your previous role and the management perhaps kindly says, hey, Nick, we'd like to get you a coach. Was there an acute moment where you stepped in it or a sort of a miss as a leader where it all of a sudden became abundantly clear or apparent to you and your leadership? We need to get this guy a coach. I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about call it a failure, call it a reckoning or call it an epiphany. I was 29 and I was the CEO of a, of a very large organization here in the UK. And I had a massive insecurity about my age and, and being at that age and leading a group of people. And I actually went on one of those like leadership courses in the mountains where you build ropes and bridges and, you know, you stay in the cold and it's actually not that much fun, but you look back at it and it's actually a great experience type in thing. And, uh, and during it, I was filmed. So every day the course was you get filmed doing it with a group of six people. And, and then at nighttime, after you've had your dinner, you replay the movie and you watch back how you are with those people. It's the best things I ever did, but one of the most awful things I've ever had to experience watching yourself back in these really, really tricky moments. And I think when I watched that back, I saw the lack of confidence I had. And when I would speak, I might say something that might be quite good, but I would hardly ever speak up because I was so insecure actually about me having kind of imposter syndrome, being surrounded by people who had way more experience than me. And I think I and they together believed a coach would really help me with my confidence and give me the ability to be much more confident and therefore have much more impact on my organization because I wasn't always, as a leader, very, very nervous about what I might be thinking because I didn't have the experience of everyone that worked for me. I think that story really resonates with me personally because I think there's definitely a generational aspect to the fear of being recorded, right? And I think that the younger generations, particularly the Generation Z, tends to have that innate confidability to be who they are, right? They don't really wait for somebody to tell them that they have value or not have value. I think the opposite can set for some of the older generations that are already in that C-suite level, if you will. What would be the piece of advice you would share with those individuals who have a resistance to maybe being recorded and then coached in that manner? You know, we are in a world today, even different to, to 10, 15 years ago, where being vulnerable and being developed and getting feedback is no longer seen as a weakness. And there are so many leaders, so many speakers, so many famous people on social media, on Twitter. And again, these aren't Gen Z people who will openly talk about a coach. I mean, the, the, the best example, and it is the most cliche example, are sports people. Sports people will often refer to their coaches as the greatest tool in helping them achieve their success. They're certainly not weak people. You know, Ronaldo, uh, Rafael Nadal, Tiger Woods, they are leaders in their sport, leaders in their field. I would say to anybody right now who is fearful of being recorded to see the upside and actually in today's world in technology and when you think about all the different places that we're recorded whether that be gong whether that be a zoom recording whether that be anything the ability to now have the chance to watch that back and whilst it might be cringy to see yourself even if no one else is giving you the feedback you're able to see for yourself where you can improve and i just think that you know, we live in a world where that never used to be possible unless you went into the mountains and, you know, paid a fortune to a Swiss business school to film you. We now all have that opportunity to have that chance. In fact, one of our largest financial services clients who buy, you know, thousands of coaching programs, the coach will observe someone in a Zoom meeting as part of the program. So you go through coaching 
And the coach will then say, when's your next team meeting coming up? Or when's your next presentation coming up? They will join the Zoom call, sit in the corner. And in your next coaching session, you actually get live feedback, not of what they've heard or what they've read on some 360 assessment, but actually on what they saw. And they'll say, hey, Karina, you know, we spoke last week about your ability to communicate a message in a way with true empathy. Here's an example of what you did last week. How do you feel that when what could have been done better? I mean, it is the most drastic improvement and way to improve. And that is just, again, with technology and the way we are today, we're incredibly blessed to have that now. And I truly believe that, that leadership at any stage of their career, if they've got any belief that they can be better or their people can be better, this kind of technology can really help. I completely agree with you because I think it's what you just shared too. It's the time aspect here, the efficiency aspect here. I mean, we all could do with more time. So the technology is able to allow you to implement that feedback quickly, but it still takes, I think, certain skill sets of a leader to know what to identify to level up their team, level up themselves. I recently heard a quote from Robert Michael Franklin Jr. He just released a book all around moral leadership, essentially. And he said it takes really three things, integrity, courage, and imagination. I would love to know what your perspective is on that. Do you think that there's different skill sets even from generation to generation or characteristics that make somebody an effective leader? I actually like integrity, um, imagination, and courage. I think that they're, they're critical. I couldn't have said it better myself. Even to use an example of what's happened here, you know, we, within this business, we, we're owned by a traditional coaching provider, and we have had to disrupt that provider, and, and well, not had to, but in doing what we've done, it's disrupted our parent, and that's taken a lot of courage and integrity has been a big part of that and obviously using imagination. So I think in today's world, those things are particularly courage, certainly in the corporate world. So the large corporate world, it is somewhat dangerous to be courageous. And if you are able in a more corporate world to continue to do what you need to do to get the job done, to never upset the apple cart, to never take a risk or a gamble, you will keep your job and you are likely to be promoted over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you couple that with what the Generation Z or, or even millennials want, which is quick promotion, they want to get through their careers much faster, they get bored after six months, quite frankly, uh, or a year, in order to progress, they need to have courage and their leaders need to have courage and agility requires courage. So I think courage is a critical part. I love that quote. Courage is a is a critical part of, of leadership. And the other thing I would say is, is conviction. So you can be incredibly courageous. You know, I could walk in and say, you know what, like, I think we should completely change the way that we structure our sales team. And I walk in and I have several meetings and I've got that courage and one or two people support my plan. But in again, because everyone is courageous, four or five people tell me the plan is useless and will never work. And therefore, there's courage to have the idea, but there's, then there's conviction to make that happen. And conviction in the face of very, very loud voices telling you this is never going to work or you shouldn't do this. Or, you know, or you know what you should do? You should go and talk to another eight people before you make this decision. Like that is a very common phrase that any sales leader will have. And by the way, there are, I don't want to say you should never get feedback and you should never go and ask other people's opinions because you should. But at some moment in time, you have to make a decision and you have to have the conviction to go through with that decision. And I think that that is something that, that I certainly see is hard to find. And therefore, one of the ways that we help organizations is if you create a psychologically safe culture where if you then make that change, it's not the end of the world if it doesn't work. That, that 
also creates a much safer playing field and the ability for people to have the conviction and courage to do things. You know, if you work in some large organizations, you can have all the best courage and conviction in the world. But, you know, if you are going to get fired or frowned upon or, you know, absolutely beat up because you made a decision, then it's a frozen type organization. So I'm talking to my own teams about what sort of culture we want and our team. And as I'm thinking about the words Karina's talking about, we've got imagination and courage and integrity. And I love it. You adding conviction to the equation, Nick. I'm thinking a lot about you have scientifically mapped key non-negotiable ingredients to what constitutes good coaching. So there's the science of it. And then there's still the art because mm -hmm. how much courage, when do you use courage? When you think about, I don't know, what are you indexing for in any given leadership moment? It can't just be so cut and dry, black and white. So can you tell us a little bit about how you at Ezra have mapped the leadership genome and then mm -hmm. when you balance the artistic delivery of leadership in conjunction with the scientific understanding that you've cultivated? It's actually a very tricky balance to get because when we work with clients and they offer coaching to thousands of people, they're doing it because they believe there are certain things at an organization. So, you know, if we're working with Spotify, Spotify will believe that there are certain behaviors that make you successful at Spotify. That's the science, right? That we think if everyone does these eight things really, really well, we are going to have a better application. We are going to sell, have more downloads, et cetera, et cetera. And, 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 and I probably have not done enough to think about the business and, and everything they need to achieve. But there are certainly behaviors they think will help them be successful. And at Ezra, what we do is we actually have a framework of behaviors, actually 35 behaviors that we know are successful. And Spotify will say, these eight are most important to us. We make sure it's in their language. And when someone logs into the app at, at Spotify, it says, which of these eight things do you need to work on the most? And they pick three. So it's already scientific in terms of what we've chosen for a company or what that company has chosen to focus on. The company then goes through what we call an Ezra measure where they measure those behaviors and see how good people are today or against these eight things, how does Danny perform? And there's a kind of clever assessment that we do and we measure them at the end and we say, did Danny get better at these eight things? That's the science, right? And, and I could speak for hours about how we've proven impact and how Clients have shown in sales and productivity, increase in behavioral impact, etc. But there's also the art. And our master coach, Tom Wright, talks about this all the time. And he says, whilst we have a model at Ezra and we have the Ezra measure, the coach's job is to meet people where they are. And quite frankly, if Karina has chosen to focus on communication on building confidence and on strategy. They're her three things, but she walks into her coaching session today and actually her biggest struggle was that this morning, two of her team quit and one of them is quiet quitting and the other two actually want a promotion. And, and she's just found that out this week. And in today's world, that happens, like that happens so it doesn't matter what you said you needed to do four weeks ago. Right now, I have some pretty big issues and I want to pick them apart with you, uh, coach. And the coach, they're, tr they're incredible. And I don't know if either of you have had coaching and I would love, especially after speaking to you, for you to both experience this. But the coach is incredible because what the coach will do is the coach will take what you have as a pretty critical situation and you're panicking and you're worried and you'd have no way to prioritize what you've done and by asking you some really pointed really good really kind really caring questions for 45 minutes you will walk out of there realizing maybe what you need to focus on is these two you can't do anything about the two that have quit and 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 that was nothing to do with what you set up in the first place but actually if one of those things was around communication, by handling this and being a lot calmer when you walk into that meeting this afternoon, you're going to handle that in a lot more effective way. So a coach, whilst you have the science, you also have just the very real nature. And that's why Ezra, by the way, and our competitors 
and why coaching is now so much more broadly used across the world is because we move at such a fast pace that you do need immediate support. Like, you know, on the app, I can go on my app right now and I can book a session for tomorrow with my coach because I've had a really bad day. By the way, even on a Saturday, we, we do it. So, you know, it's very much about the art comes into meeting people where they are at a time that they need it about a topic that they just need support with because they didn't know that was going to happen last week. And no leadership program, no time in the mountains actually can help you with what you experienced this morning. A coach can. And that is why coaching, not just Ezra coaching, but coaching is so much more powerful because it's so relevant because it's about you at that moment. According to a study done by Microsoft, 66% of global leaders are looking to support hybrid workplaces. So while coaching used to be a predominantly in-person activity, it's no wonder that digital coaching options are becoming more readily available. And as Nick just mentioned, there are tons of perks to virtual coaching, more accessibility on weekends and evenings, a wider range of coaches, and the ability to specialize with a specific type of coach based on your needs. Now, let's get back to it with Nick as we dive deeper into why now may be the best time to uplevel your coaching. You spoke previously to the stigma of vulnerability and the stigma of I need help. And generationally, we now lean into that. We celebrate that. And I think it's easy from a corporate standpoint to say, we want to give our people coaches when times are good. And here we are, we sit in a very different economic climate where all CFOs and executives are being forced to confront tighter budgets, being asked to do more with less. And I'm wondering when there's still the lingering traces of coaching is a nice to have, we want our people to be yeah. happy, but when the rubber meets the road, we're a business. And the CFO yeah. with his or her conviction has to make the tough calls. What's going to hit the chopping block or the editing room floor? How have you defended the indispensability of something like coaching that maybe is perceived wrongly or not as a nice to yeah. have? How do you make sure that that is something that persists through tighter budgets and economic headwinds? During tough times, you need a coach more than ever, right? You know, during tough times, you know, you think about any personal or work situation that happened, a redundancy situation, losing deals, God forbid, something tragic at home. One of the first things you remember about those situations is how did my boss handle that situation? It's like it's actually a phrase. How did my boss deal with that? Oh, my boss was great. Or you know what? The situation was awful, but my boss really helped me through it. Or the situation was awful. My boss was nowhere to be seen, right? That, that's a phrase, right? And a coach can help that boss be great, right? That is what coaching does. So, you know, quite frankly, for the amount it costs versus the impact that that boss can have. I mean, at the end of the day, if we go through a recession, one of the, you know, phrases that will get said is you've got to do more with less. So you've got to have, you're going to have, you're going to have three people in your team instead of six people in your team. And you need those three people to work harder or just as hard as the six people did before. Like I'm simplifying it, but that is an outcome that could happen over the next few months and hopefully not, not, but it might happen. If you're an incredible leader and, and assuming Ezra makes people better leaders, we've got to make that assumption. And I think that there is a lot of evidence now that says when you have a coach, it's not a nicety. It does make you better. It does make you more effective. It does make you a better communicator. It does make you more confident. It does help you prioritize. If all of those things are true and you're now having to do more with less, for me, quite frankly, this is a time. And to be fair, a lot of our clients are saying this to us. They're saying well, the last thing we want to do right now is cut off the support that our, our people are not just like enjoying because it's making them happier and making them feel, you know, nicer. It's making them more effective leaders. It's making them more valued in this organization. It's making them feel far more invested in. The last thing we actually want to do is we want that person to quit because we need that person more than ever. And if they've got a coach that helps them feel more confident, more invested in, they're not going to quit. We've seen like 
17% of people that have Ezra, if you take a, a group of 100 in one company and you, and you give it to those and you don't give it to the other 100 in the company and you look a year later, 17% more of the people that got Ezra are still there. So it has a massive impact on retention. So now you actually want to keep your best people. Now is not the time to cut coaching. And again, to be honest, we, are, we haven't seen that. We haven't seen yet because I think this is a different type of recession. I think people do realize the value of the coaching can have. And I think people are seeing that because it's not as costly as it used to be, it's an affordable investment to make, particularly as things start to get tough. I would love to hear your perspective on the angle of people that are in these unfortunate positions of layoffs or uh, choosing to make the next leap in their career because their current organization isn't valuing things the same way they are. Uh, you mentioned in an article that a colleague once shared with you a quote, if you don't love people, don't lead. And that resonated and spoke to me deeply because I think that's a quality that is very absent in many leaders because we think about leaders as just leveling up your experience in your career, but that's not what it means to lead. So I want to know for folks that may be in these positions who have been laid off or are looking for that next company to see their value, what qualities should they be displaying when they're in these interviews that show that they truly are capable of effective leadership? So prior to this role, I was the CEO of a company, the largest outplacement company in the world. And outplacement is helping people lose their jobs. And I wasn't the global CEO, I was the UK CEO. So every day we would deal with hundreds or thousands of people who just lost their roles. And your question's very relevant now to the, to the job I had before. And I think the first thing is for anyone right now who is unfortunate enough to lose a job and they're in that situation, it is actually an opportunity for you. There are, we're in a world, it's a different type of recession. There is still a shortage of talent. You know, I know even in Ezra, we're still struggling to hire great people. So it's incredibly likely that, are, that there are organizations out there who, who you can approach, who you can target, or who will be in touch with you. And your network, I would say, again, this isn't the, uh, what you asked me, but I will just offer this free advice. You are far more likely to find a role through your network. And your network isn't just the people that you worked with yesterday. Your network is anyone who you've come across in the last 15 years. And please don't have too much pride. Be courageous to reach out to someone you worked with nine years ago, because there might be every chance they are looking for someone just like you and they haven't thought about you. So I would say, please use your network because it has a massive impact on your ability to find a new job. And then when you go to that new opportunity, don't bring your baggage, don't bring stuff that's happened to you in the past. Think about the opportunity that lies ahead of you and walk into that interview with confidence in yourself, with confidence in your ability, really understanding the organization. I would look at the organization's values. Most organizations now have a set of values. I know Gong do, I know we do at Ezra. We say, and we mean it, we hire people against those values. And when you're in that interview, especially as a leader, I would talk actually about how in your life and your work life, how you have lived those values in other ways. Because if I ever interview a candidate and they walk in as a leader and they've understood what values we have at Ezra, and they talk about situations where they owned it together or where they cared deeply or where they enjoyed the values that we have, I'm completely won over by, by them and, and certainly if the examples are good. Well, Nick, I can't thank you enough. Danny and I so appreciate your insight, your background, your time and your willingness to share with all of us. We have just one final question for you and it's a question that we ask all of our audience and uh, Danny and I like to shake things up a little bit from time to time. So what we usually ask is, how would you describe sales in one word? But because of the beautiful nature of this episode, I would like to ask you, Nick, how would you describe coaching in one word? Life-changing. Coaching can, I mean, I hear it every day. Coaching change people's, changes people's perspective. It changes people's thinking. It 
it helps them in way it, it opens up you know the big part of your brain that was never open before which changes your life and it changes your life and then we talk at Ezra a lot about the ripple effect you know whilst we have coached 20,000 leaders this year they've led teams of hundreds of thousands of people um, they have families it's a life-changing thing because it has a massive impact on people and the people around them just gives me like chills and warm and fuzzies to <laughs> compute what it is that you do both in terms of scale and purpose Nick and as someone who aspires to lead teams of the size that you lead at Ezra I just so appreciate you normalizing that those leaders are not to be emotionless and entirely calculated and possess purely the conviction to make the hard calls because that's what it takes to compete at the highest of levels, but no, to lean in and own and acknowledge your own challenges and that you can't be expected to do that all on your own and that to ask for help is in fact a demonstration of courage and leadership. So call it either debunking the gender norms that I think especially men have in leadership roles and trying yeah. to break those tendencies or just for any gender or any person in a role to very gladly and willingly accept this shit is hard yeah, and help exists and why make it harder on yourself? So thank you for evangelizing a new temperament and disposition towards these challenges. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Reveal. If you want more resources on how revenue intelligence can help you create high-performing sales teams, head on over to gong.io. If you like what you heard, please consider giving us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. 